How are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Ben. How are you today? I'm doing great. And, uh, so thrilled, of course, that you are joining us for our coffee. I assume you have your coffee cup with you. I've got my coffee cup and uh, here we go. But, uh, can you see it? There it is. Okay. <laughs> it's a uh, uh, interesting enough, I got this kind of coffee cup in Italy a number of years ago, and uh, it's my favorite coffee cup. And we've gone through about six of them um, because they get broken. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing is that they're mass produced. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, I suspect folks will continue to drop in. And as this is a Zoom format, you're going to hear that ding dong. I don't know if everybody else can hear the ding dong. I can hear the ding dong, but uh, that's fine. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, where else do we hear ding dongs in life that we might worry about a uh, Pavlovian response? Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think we're going to talk about that today a little bit. The ding dongs that we're uh, experiencing in the crisis and risk communications field. Actually, uh, I think I just, actually I think in emergency rooms, uh, if your heart be, heart stops, <laughs> you get a ding dong, um, and all the nurses and doctors run in. Exactly. So, <laughs> hey, uh, I just want to take a quick minute and thank you, Vincent, for joining us. And uh, of course, to thank everybody who's dropping in. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody's coming to hear what we have to say. But clearly, there's over 100, 100, almost 150 people, Vincent, that have dropped in to hear what you have to say. Oh, so we're nice, so, uh, nice. yeah, Good. so grateful for, for the opportunity um, to, to speak with you. Uh, it's more important now than ever, I think, to have really great um, dialogue. I just want to uh, welcome all of you who have joined us for Crisis and Coffee. This is uh, an event we put on the first Thursday of every month at noon Mountain Time, 2 o'clock Eastern. And it's just an open, have coffee with some amazing people. And uh, we, use the, we use the expression, ask, share, explore just an opportunity to share your ideas, share your experience, ask questions, and maybe get some help along the way. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have a special guest, sometimes we do, and today we have Dr. Cavella with us. Uh, this is very, um, this is a Zoom meeting format, so we'll just ask that you try to keep your mics muted, uh, and then we will use the chat box, uh, the chat room function, uh, to engage. And then at that point, maybe we'll pop you on your mic and your camera and you can, um, you know, ask a question to Vincent if we have time. We did have a few folks send questions in ahead of time so that we would like to, uh, to try to address. Uh, so that's kind of the format for today. Uh, just imagine if you will, uh, you popped into a coffee shop and there's Vincent Cavello having uh, coffee with myself and my, my business partner, Jeff Angel. And our team member Megan Fox is here, and I think I saw Tim Conrad pop in, and I think I saw Dr. Peter Ryan, and I got to give a shout out to my mom and Professor Marianne Neal, who I saw also joining in. So this is absolutely wonderful and humbling. Before I turn it over to Dr. Cavello uh, for some conversation, I would very much appreciate if you uh, just put in the chat, chat box how did you hear about Crisis and Coffee? I'm just trying to get a sense for how you came across the, uh, the Crisis and Coffee. We didn't do any paid promotion or anything like this. Uh, we just put it out there. So if you don't mind us dropping in there, did you see it on our website? Did you get it in our newsletter? Did you find it on our company LinkedIn? Did somebody tell you about it? Just so we can get a sense of, uh, of where folks are finding us from. So I'd appreciate that. Oh, look at that. It's all coming in. Thank you very much for doing that. Vincent, I also want to tell you that I, on Monday, mm -hmm. uh, I started teaching uh, risk and crisis communications at Royal Roads University in the School of Humanitarian Studies, uh, mm -hmm. Master of Arts course. And, Wonderful. Good. And this next week. Live. Next you, week, you were live. You were, you were there in person or virtually? Uh, we do it virtually. Oh, oh okay. All right. But uh, week two, we introduce uh, Dr. Cavello, um, Communications Under Fire, and some of the core principles. And some of those folks have dropped in today. To, oh, good, uh, good. To listen, listen to you. So good. very, very grateful for your time. So I'll just kick it off and just, hey, uh, top of mind for a lot of people and for myself, Vincent, is this. So I... 
you know, I, I practice and preach the Godfather word of high stress, high concern situations, how they change the rules of communication. And, and we talk about your formulas, 2793, uh, CCO, no go do all of those powerful tools that you've created. But when we have this high stress, high concern situation, that's going on and on and on and on. Right. right. How, how can we, or can we adjust our communication styles when we're dealing with audiences who are angry, confused, stressed, and I think in many ways, incredibly exhausted. Um, okay. Yeah. How, what would you say mm. to the communications folks about how can we, how can we be heard? when we're all just so tired. Okay. Ben and Jeff, I'm gonna begin by saying that um, if for any reason there's not enough seats at the coffee uh, counter, uh, that you could certainly get virtually everything that I'm gonna say next about that too from Jeff and from Ben. So, uh, um, and uh, if I have to be excused because I'm going to the bathroom, just keep talking to Jeff and Ben, all right? And, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, be, let me just uh, take that. That's a big question. So I'll try to uh, reduce it down in size to something that's more manageable. Uh, we've got the usual suspects out there uh, when we deal with virtually any risk issue, high stress, high concern issue. Um, three that you mentioned, for example, uh, keep it short and simple. That's because people have difficulty processing information. Uh, second is that when people are stressed, they tend to focus more on the negative than the positive. Um, so therefore, uh, you expect that anything negative, for example, uh, side effects of vaccination, they get a lot more attention than the efficacy, for example, would be. Uh, a third would be people want to know that you care before they care what you know. Uh, again, these are the usual suspects, the three ones. Uh, people are difficulty processing information, therefore keep it short and simple. People want to know that you care before they care what you know, therefore start off with caring empathy. And number three, they'll focus more on the negative than the positives, therefore try to find as many positives as, pos as you can. Um, those would be the usual suspects, the usual suspects. Um, so if I was the detective and saying, well, how do we deal with this rash of crime going on that's causing people stress and anxiety, I would start with that. The two additional ones that are making life much more difficult uh, are that when you have very high stress, and Ben, you just mentioned all those stress, everything from inconsistency, uh, lockdowns, um, uh, lies, et cetera, uh, that you get much higher levels of distrust, um, even from traditional sources of information. So that's the fourth expectation. Uh, first of all, they're gonna have difficulty hearing what you have to say. Number two, they're going to want to know that you care or empathic. Number three, they're going to focus more on the negative, and they're not going to trust you. They're not going to trust you. All right. Um, so uh, that's another uphill battle that you have to go to. Imagine, for example, there's five peaks. Uh, uh, when I was much younger, I used to climb mountains. Um, the Matterhorn is, is, was my final uh, attempt where I fell off the mountain. Um, I still have a broken thumb from it. Uh, but I, I really disliked that mountain because there are five places where you think you're at the top, but you're not. So you're totally exhausted. Uh, you see what looks like the top of the mountain, and then you get to the top and realize there's another mountain behind it uh, or another peak, and then you go up and up. So there's five, I'll use the analogy of there's five peaks um, that you have to get uh, to get to the top of the mountain. So the fourth is this distrust. How do you overcome the distrust issue? And I'll say one thing's coming out of a lot of the research now on vaccination is that people tend to trust most those that are closest to them. Uh, when there's high levels of distrust, we tend to trust most those that are closest to them. And again, I, for those who are scientists, uh, controlling for all other variables. For example, if the person closest to you is Idi Amin, I'm not sure if you would necessarily trust what Idi Amin. I'm not sure if I even... Jeff, do you remember who Idi Amin is for anyone who lost track of that from... Uh, <laughs> can you give a... Just going to hear your voice. Who is... Why would you not trust what Idi Amin would say to you, Jeff? Uh, right. So crazy African dictator of Uganda put in his place by the, uh, by the Mossad and the Israeli special forces when they uh, rescued all the 
Hostage is okay. at Entebbe, yes. <laughs> there it is. Great, Jeff. And that was not rehearsed, by the way, what Jeff just said. <laughs> uh, now, if, if Idi, Idi Amin had said to you, he's close to you, let's say you're one of his confidants, and said, don't worry, Jeff, um, I'm not going to throw you under the bus. Would you believe Idi Amin? Okay. All right. All right. So uh, holding constant other variables, such as the integrity of the person uh, who you're close to, uh, uh, we tend to look for people closest to us as sources of trust. And for the vaccination, more and more research is coming out that the two, uh, two categories of individuals that are most trusted are uh, the personal physician or healthcare worker, and number two, friends and relatives. Actually, if you want three, since I like three, relatives, friends, personal healthcare um, provider. Um, and therefore, if we want to be effective in a extreme high stress environment, we've got to get to those people uh, because those are the ones that people will turn to first. Uh, they'll turn to their friends, they'll turn to their relatives and they'll turn to their personal um, uh, healthcare provider in the process. Uh, Ben, Jeff, does that make sense? Uh, as, and that is something that I'm, I'm sharing. This is coming from research that I know a lot of folks in the United States are doing WHO. Uh, uh, I would assume that it would be the same. In fact, perhaps, perhaps even more so in Canada, where uh, I, I'm not going to share the reasons I'm saying that, but nonetheless, I would suspect that there's a number of cultural characteristics that would make that even more so. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Ben or Jeff? Or uh, you know what, I'll, uh, Vincent, I'll I'll take a stab at that because uh, uh, Ben and I were talking about that actually just before the call. And up here in Canada, something called the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations just a day or two ago came out and said that it's actually preferable if you can get the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine over the AstraZeneca vaccine. So I, I'm wondering if you could comment. And, and that sent everybody yeah. into a bit of a tizzy up here. There seems to me, so a general comment, there seems to me that, you know, over a year on in, it's almost like we've forgotten the basic rules of communications or crisis communications, certainly. And, and then when we have different, uh, different physicians advising different things, no, no wonder people are stressed and, you know, it's, 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 it's a high concern topic and it's right. stress. Right. I'm wondering if you can, yeah. Um, and you seem to, in the United States, uh, this isn't a political comment, but perhaps right. because the, the president was more, uh, this president took the virus a little more seriously and, and right. Right. Have marshaled right. the troops. I think we're feeling a little bit of envy up right. here in Canada because we can be a little, we can feel a little superior when it comes to the United States. You know, I think we're, we're a little more worldly and stuff, but now we look look down there and you're actually, I mean, you've got uh, Biden set the goal of 100 million vaccines in his first 100 days, actually hit 200 million, over 200 million. So I, I think a little bit of leadership goes a long way would be my comment, but I'd be super interested to hear you you comment yeah. on the, it seems like the basics have been lost. And, and when physicians fight with one another, I mean, it obviously doesn't help. I'd love to hear your views on that. Yeah. Well, one thing about physicians is that they, they, they're communicating in different ways, including starting off with themselves, and then they're communicating to, for example, other healthcare workers, for example, if they're in a the hospital, so then they're also communicating with their patients. And uh, so you have three different audiences. And one of the ways we tried to deal with that in the United States was uh, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers produced a document. Uh, it was a risk communication document on COVID directed at physicians. Uh, and healthcare workers. And at the very top of the messaging was the, uh, the soundbite, that 2793 that we talk about. Um, then there was another layer, just in case the physician, another physician or a healthcare worker would question you, you have another layer to go to. What was nice about those message maps is we had six layers of information, which means that the physician who was still skeptical after, for example, getting it from a reputable organization, in this case, the Association of State uh, and Territorial Health Officers, they could actually go to the raw data itself in order to see what the raw data was saying. Or they could go to a medical journal. Now, you're not going to say generally to a patient, go to a medical journal and take a look at the Journal of the American Medical Association or Lancet, etc. Uh, why? Because they're not intended to be read by a general audience. The physician, though, should be able to read those, those articles. 
And what they wanted from us was access to that information, uh, a curating of it, uh, just in the same way you curate at a, at a museum. They wanted a curated uh, set, for example, in Lancet, I think they were getting about 100 articles a week on COVID. Uh, and that would also be impossible for the physician to stay on top of that. And also making things even worse is a lot of these articles were not even going through the traditional peer review process. Um, um, uh, in fact, there were things appearing even that were in pre-publication. I mean, this is a new phenomenon where things start appearing in the literature, get quoted by the media that are not even had gone through the publication peer review process. So what we did is we curated, we looked at those 100 articles and sorted out ones that, for example, had a larger sample size, were confirmed by other studies. They weren't just simple, a single study, uh, but they were confirmed by other studies. So we had a number of elements by which we curated. And then we provided that, the actual raw material. So they could press a button and get a Lancet article or a Journal of American Medical Association and pull it up. And we found that they were satisfied. Um, and that actually took away a lot of the arguments amongst each other, because if one physician said, well, my patients have been having good um, results with the vaccine, another would say, well, my patients are not having good results, they're having a, some very severe side effects, then the physician who wants to prove the case would say, well, let me show you this curated set of articles from the leading medical journals of the world, talking about side effects. And that would often stop the discussion. It would quite literally would stop the discussion because it was evidence-based evidence-based in terms of peer-reviewed research. So the physician on the one hand had the summary to give to the patient, but they also had the depth of knowledge that they could draw on for the purposes of establishing trust to themselves. I don't, you know, the physician was saying, I don't wanna share something to a patient that I don't believe myself. I'm not gonna say it just because, for example, the Canadian government said this is the, the party line in the process. Is that helpful? Uh, is that helpful to think about that or? Uh... Yeah, for sure. And we, we sure need something like that up here, Vincent. Uh, and I know that you worked on that uh, personally, you and uh, Dr. Randy Heyer. Right. So uh, that's great work, um, you know, and, and, and thank you. Thank you for that. I, I also wonder if you could comment. Wait, to, gi to give an example of how popular that became, uh, in the first week of publication, it was called COVID-19, um, a risk communication guide. We had 720,000 downloads, 720,000 downloads. Uh, right. And a lot of those from work from healthcare workers who want to know um, not just what to say to others who are not experts, but also to satisfy their own uh, information needs. And, and uh, right. now there's other ways to solve the problem too, which is, you know, um, uh, for example, uh, having lots more meetings where physicians can talk to each other and establish their own criteria by which to decide which studies. Uh, and the, the other complexity which you brought up is, you know, who do you believe? We stopped doing the ASTO document because um, a lot of the folks at CDC who were political appointees left. Um, and so another phenomenon which is unique to COVID is the politicization of science. Uh, and that's a good way to undermine trust in science when you turn it into politics. Um, um, and uh, once we had a, a different administration take over where they seem to put more faith in science than in politics, uh, we've seen a sea change in terms of people's re reliance on the CDC, which traditionally was the credible source of information, both for physicians as well as for the general public. Then they lost credibility because of uh, uh, the politicization of the issue. Uh, and one of the things that specifically in Alberta that's been challenging for the premier up here, if you have a, uh, uh, and I know you know her, Chief uh, Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, um, you were, I, you, you met her a couple of times and, and uh, she's, uh, she's a fan of the show. Uh, <laughs> if we were in television, we'd say she's a, a fan of yours and uh, um, Ben and I have worked with her a bit. So full disclosure, we're partial to her. But one of the things that the problems that we're having in Alberta is she gives her medical advice to the premier in private. It's not transparent. And it gets her to go out and say, here's what cabinet has decided. 
And I'm wondering if you got, there, there's yeah. to me a, a clearly obvious step because the premier is getting it from both sides here in Alberta. He's getting it from the people that don't think we've done enough restrictions and he's getting it from the people that think the restrictions are draconian. And that lack of transparency um, is, it, he's really taking a beating for it. I, I wonder if right. you yeah. Uh, you can comment well, on that, and I know we'll, we'll, we'll get to the, uh, I know yeah. we have a lot of questions in the chat here, but I, I'd yeah. love to hear your, your your thoughts on that. Well, l let me take, um, I, I'm writing up a case study now of, of different countries and how they communicated about uh, COVID from the very beginning, um, starting with the Chinese all the way through the, the present. And one of the most impressive examples I've seen of, of transparency is what's been taking place in New Zealand in New Zealand uh, with the Prime Minister Arden. Uh, an example, uh, as opposed to what you just shared with me, is that the, uh, the health minister would then share with the premier, for example, information in private, and then the premier would speak. But she would actually have breakfast with the scientists, including the health minister. And they would actually be chatting with coffee or tea about the latest evidence of the day. Um, and they would have an animated discussion. You know, uh, for example, one person might be there at the breakfast table and say, well, that's not consistent with all the other research. And the, the prime minister is listening to this. And then another person says, well, uh, you know, but uh, keep in mind who did that research. And they were dot, 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 whatever it might be. And you quite literally saw the, in, it's, oh, sorry, you saw sort of bare closed. Um, they were naked. Um, and you were seeing what was taking place, what is typically taking place behind the screen, behind closed doors, taking place right in front of you as they were debating, for example, everything from the science to policies that might relate it to the science. Uh, that's been extraordinarily successful. Now, uh, I, I, of course, tomorrow there could be a hiccup. Um, uh, uh, this is the strange thing about where we had a lot of, for example, groups doing the right thing on COVID and then all of a sudden it all fell apart. Um, there's some unusual mechanisms going on right now in the world that making life uh, even more hard to predict in the future. But nonetheless, I'd suggest anyone who's interested in, in how to deal with transparency, to take a look at the New Zealand case. Uh, they've had extraordinarily few cases and she also had mottos. Uh, she understood the, the, uh, the principles of media communication, for example, uh, go hard, go fast, you know, uh, 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 she recruited uh, individuals to, for example, tourism as a major source of income. Uh, she was able to recruit them. And I think that all happened in British Columbia in Canada also, where they, uh, they brought the tourism folks in into the COVID conversation, uh, which you typically would not do. And that's what they did also in New Zealand. So uh, uh, what, what actually happened, I, I was reading about it. I was at a, I'm not finished with the Canadian case, but I came up with some British Columbian things. Am, am I right on that? That tourism, that, I mean, it's a major source and they uh, they got involved in the conversation. Uh, am, I, am I right on that, Jeff or Ben? Right. Yeah, for sure. Tourism uh, in all of Canada is, is big money for us. And it's, as I assume it would be for New Zealand, um, so it, it, you, but you can see the, and I, I say that I have great empathy for the political leaders that are trying to figure this way out, that they had little or no training, uh, on, on a worldwide pandemic. So, I mean, I have a lot of empathy, uh, for everyone. It, it, it seems to me the, the leaders that, um, are kind of twisting themselves in knots, um, because of their, uh, their, their view of the role of government would be more on the conservative slash Republican side of scales where, you know, before you just thought just generally their view was less government is, is the way to go. And they could, they would, they would make that case. And there's, there's a strong case for that. Um, but in, in a worldwide pandemic, there's really the need for government and leadership and crisis communications. Um, right. we're going to have to draft you up here, Vincent, we'll pay for your, three-day isolation at the hotel and, and bring you up to the center. Um, but I think, I think as a general comment, and it seems to have settled down. I mean, Alberta is the, I said this to a couple of friends the other day, Alberta is the per capita, the highest rate of COVID in North America right now. And a couple of friends said, yeah, well, that's because the U.S. has been so successful in their vaccination rollout in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's interesting how the, the, uh, the scales have tilted a little bit. It used to be 
I'll be honest, you know, we, we looked to the U.S. last year like it was a bit of a dumpster fire. And now we look with more than a right. little bit of envy about how well things are, yeah. uh, things seem to be rolling out there. Yeah. Was it slow vaccination in Alberta? I, I didn't realize that, that uh, you've got the highest rates now in North America. I yeah, per capita, per capita. Per capita. Yeah. Per capita. yeah. Right. Um, it's been slow. Uh, the apolitical comment is Canada was slow securing vaccines uh the provinces so similar to you know you've got 50 states obviously in the u.s similar we've got we've got 10 provinces and three territories the rollout's been slow and it's been you know it's it's been dissected in the media every day and um and you know this right when you're when you're if you're when your sports team is losing everywhere you look there are problems so that's kind of feels like that's where we are as a country and certainly in alberta I mentioned before the uh, the focus on the negative is one of those changes that take place. Uh, one of the interesting characteristics of COVID, especially vaccination, is the compression of time that's taking place. Uh, not just the compression of time in terms of developing the vaccine, but compression of time of the um, uh, giving of the vaccine. And the reason for that is because you're going to get almost every day uh, at least one side effect. Uh, uh, usually those side effects would be dispersed over months or years. When you're trying to get uh, 3 million people, for example, vaccinated, you know, uh, every week, you're going to start getting almost every day a negative effect, which will pick up, be picked up by the media. Somebody had a blood clot, somebody had this or whatever. And therefore, what people are reading every day in the newspaper is, Another person down, another person down. Of course, when you have a million people who are involved in the battle, you are gonna have one person down um, uh, almost every day, except the the problem is that becomes the focus. And then of course it's picked up by social media uh, uh, and then becomes, um, you know, the tsunami. um, uh, Why would we ever wanna get vaccinated if in fact these times? And it's interesting when you think about Canada with the numbers in the United States that are going through vaccination, you're probably going to pick up the media responses here to the side effects, which will then become uh, overemphasized within a much smaller population. So, for example, the population of Alberta is what? Um, uh, uh, this is a test. This we're, is we're about, yeah, <laughs> I think we're about 3.1, 3.2 million off the right. top of the head, maybe 3.5. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, when you're talking about, for example, if, if you said we're going to vaccinate all 1.5 million Albertans tomorrow, uh, you're going to see some side effects. Um, uh, and they'll, of course, they become much more interesting from a media perspective as well as a public perspective. And so there's another strange aspect of this whole, whole COVID thing, this compression of time. Uh, first of all, miracles, compression of time usually takes five to 10 years to develop a vaccine. Now we got something in six months, but also we're trying to give virtually the entire world the vaccine within six months. Um, and you're going to get a lot more negative information. Negative information attracts more attention than positive information in high stress. And therefore, what's dominating the discussion are these discussions of the negatives. Um, and, and that's really interesting. I know, and I know that's that's your theory. One N, one negative right. takes three P's, three positives to balance that out. And I remember, and I think it was in one of your early uh, classes that we were part of, you, you said that there's even some research that says they actually need more than the three positives, right? That in, in some case it can, it can be more than three. It could be five. I think you even said it might be, might possibly yeah. go as high as 10. Yeah. Um, actually five tends to have to be the, the interesting thing about numbers is that uh, that first came from the Nobel prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, who talked about the uh, asymmetry between positives and negatives. Uh, and the first is find the best three to offset the negative. Then you, you're back to zero. Then you get one more to four. And here's the interesting thing, though. Uh, after five, you get what's called marginal returns, marginal returns uh, that uh, they're not equal to each other. So one, two, three, four, and five could be equal in terms of offsetting the negative. The sixth and the seventh have very little additional value they're added. So therefore, if you've got a sixth or a seventh, you make that a whole separate set of messages. You don't uh, keep saying, let me give you the 50 reasons to um, uh, leave your lover. Um, um, uh, and you're a good New Yorker with that reference. I actually once when I was, I was uh, on a Southwest airline flight and she said there might be 50 ways to leave your lover, but there's only two ways to leave this airplane. <laughs> Southwest, yeah. 
Yeah, West Jets like that up here. Yeah. Um, uh, by the way, that's a violation of the principle of high stress, high concern, no right, humor. Right. <laughs> but strange enough, it actually got my attention. Uh, it got my attention because uh, I was uh, reading, uh, I think, People magazine, which I often do when we take off. <laughs> it, it doesn't require much attention. Uh, and, uh, but when she said there may be 50 ways to leave your lover, all of a sudden I said, oh. <laughs> uh, and then she said, but there's only two. But she used the word but again. Um, she also used the word but. Uh, uh, ben, I know you don't like the word but. What's wrong with the word but for those who are joining us for the first time? <laughs> well, the word but is an, as a negator. So once you use the word but in any sentence, you're negating everything that you've said up until that point. So what did the Southwest airline person then say to people? If uh, there may be 50 ways to leave your lover, but there's only two ways to leave the airplane. <laughs> Stop your sentence. There's 50 <laughs> ways. There's 50 ways to leave, leave your lover, period. There are two ways to exit this aircraft. Right. Or maybe there really are not 50 ways to leave your lover. <laughs> More likely than not. Not 50 safe ways. <laughs> there probably could be three ways to leave your lover. <laughs> In the now, Darren, now, Darren Butt, who is in our uh, audience here, says, what's the problem with the word butt? Because yeah. his last name <laughs> <It's> is <awesome. laughs> so, Ah, okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry about that. But, right. right there, uh, yeah. I, wonder if, I wonder if you can just take a couple minutes and talk about some of the core fundamentals of risk communication. So risk communication, um, as I've come to understand it, is ultimately looking for a behavioral response from your audience. Right. Risk communication more often will focus on consequence versus the cause. Mm -hmm. Risk communication, we want to try to provide our audience with enough information so that they can make their own informed choice rather than feeling that they're being forced into something. Right, right. And needs to come from a trust and credible source. Yeah, good. But um, if you could just play with that a little bit, some of the, if you were baking a risk communication cake, what yeah, ingredients yeah. would you be dropping into the bowl um, to create your message before sharing it with your audience, hoping that they'll eat it and say yeah. that was really good? So this is a five layer cake. Um, you had five things. So I'm going to listen as carefully as I can again and see if there's a, remember, I'm getting a marginal return from six and seven. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and so therefore I have to be really careful that I'm putting another layer on that makes any difference whatsoever in thinking about risk communication. So I'm going to give you the value of, of repetition, which is marketers have known this for, for ages, that repetition is one of the key principles of communication. So therefore I give you the free reign to, can you repeat those five elements? I think you had five elements. I, I, I wasn't taking notes. I wasn't taking notes either. Oh, uh, okay. okay. So <laughs> risk communication, we, we look for a behavioral response from our audience. We want them to get the vaccine so they don't get sick. We want them to wear a mask so they don't spread COVID. We don't want you to touch that high voltage electrical wire so that you don't get electrocuted. Right. So right. risk communication is looking for a behavioral response from your audience. All right. Risk communication more often than not will focus on the consequence as opposed okay. to the causing. Okay. So we're not really talking about bats in China anymore. We're talking about overcrowding ICUs. We're talking about overcapacities in the health in the uh, right. healthcare system. We're talking about fatalities. That's one right. of the primary drivers. So we focus on consequence. Okay. Good. All right. I am taking notes now. By the way, that's why you see me looking down. Right. Okay. okay. So con consequence focused, behavioral driven, uh, risk communication looks for, uh, to prov is usually scientifically based. So we want to provide our audience with enough information that the audience feels they are making their own informed decision. Right. And I think right. you could tie that back to the vaccinations. Right. Right. Here's enough information. We want you to make your best informed decision. Right. Okay. Uh, what else did I have in there? That was, that's three layers. Okay. Uh, risk communication needs to come from a trusted and credible source. Right, right, right. We need to have trust in who's who's asking us to do this behavior. Right, right. Okay, good. So there's four. Um, there's four. I thought there was five, but uh, Jeff, did you hear a fifth? Or maybe I was No, but I, we, this is a perfect segue. To, I saw a question in the chat from John who said he's got in his close circle – uh, staunch anti-vaxxer. So I'm wondering if 
uh, in answer to your the, the the setup with Ben's question, if we had someone in our own circle like John does that is a staunch anti-vaxxer, how given that formula that you and Ben just talked about, how might how might we use that to influence their opinion yeah. on getting a vaccination? Okay. The um, first of all, the the, the reasons for uh, either vaccine vaccination hesitancy or vaccination refusal is probably one of the most complex issues in the academic world. Um, WHO held a conference on it, uh, I think about three years ago, uh, where they talked about the, the factors that contribute to vaccine refusal or vaccination hesitancy. And I believe they stopped eventually with 25 different factors, 25, uh, any of which could play a role with an individual. Everything from distrust of government um, at a very large, uh, you know, macro level. I don't trust anything the government tells me. Um, uh, to uh, personal freedom, um, this is my choice to uh, what I do with my body. Nobody is going to tell me what to do with my body. I don't care if it's my friend or the government. Uh, to concerns about too fast uh, development, um, uh, side effects, uh, access. Uh, I can't get off from work in order to go to get vaccinated. I can't afford, for example, to, to have to stay home for two days if I have a side effect. Um, even if it's a mild side effect and I can't go to work, uh, I can't afford that. So they got up to 25 and eventually they said, this is more complicated than it looks, which means you have to listen really careful to folks. So uh, I would say, Ben, I'm gonna add a, a fifth one, which is the importance of listening. Um, the importance of listening, because you're not going to crack through that, that those barriers to vaccination unless you listen carefully to what is driving the person, um, uh, ranging from these macro to these, um, you could argue, uh, logistical issues. I, I need transportation. I'm 95 years old, the person might say. How am I supposed to get to a, a school and wait for three hours online uh, on a cold winter day? Um, I'm sorry, you don't understand what it's like to be a 95-year-old. Um, the person will say uh, that would be at the logistical micro level as opposed to the micro. So I would add listening in to number. Um, it's the importance, Ben, of listening. If I was had the opportunity to make a five-layer cake as opposed to a four-layer cake, which you had, I'd ask the listening. It's um, uh, being attentive to the listening part which in ten, informs everything else. Um, it informs, for example, what consequences are people, what behaviors are we looking to change? Uh, what are the yeah. consequences? Who do people trust? Who they don't trust? Why they don't trust? And if you're good at listening, you're gonna break through a lot of those other four things you just mentioned. Um, and then the last one, the last one I'll just mention is, um, when I heard you go through the list, I was looking for the emotional part not just changing people's behavior, such as wearing a mask. Or, um, I, I'm thinking about the mental health part of the individual, where they're stressed, they're anxious, they're worried, uh, they can't sleep, they, um, they're, you know, they're grouchy, they're, they're unpleasant to be around, et cetera, like that. that there are, uh, and these might be considered to be behaviors, but I think when you were describing it, you were describing it in terms of of behavior such as wearing a mask or getting vaccinated. I'm thinking about what's going on in the head of the individual. Uh, where right. is their emotional life, their emotional life. And uh, that was the breakthrough I believe that Peter Salmon really gave to us when he said uh, uh, that was driving a person's decisions about risk are based in part on things such as probabilities, magnitudes, trust, et cetera. But he also said there's at least 20 other factors that are driving that decision, all of which are emotionally based, um, uh, linked very much to things such as fear, uh, voluntariness, control, uh, catastrophic potential, whether or not it has catastrophic potential, whether or not it affects my children as opposed to adults, all these. Uh, and he introduced that term outrage, outrage, uh, which I think was, if I had to sort of list uh, great contributions of risk communication over the past, let's say 50 years, I would say, uh, I think outrage is too strong a term. It's it, the emotional response to risk. But nonetheless, recognizing the importance of that in, in human decision-making was one of the great contributions of, of science in the last 50 years from a psychological and neuroscience basis. Uh, we also see this in the neuroscience research, the same thing. Uh, for example, uh, bad news does not go directly into the frontal lobe of the brain. It goes to the amygdala, the fight or flight part of the brain, a uh, very primitive part of the brain. 
uh, which often leads to very primitive responses, emotional responses uh, that have very, very little basis in logic. Uh, and so uh, I just added a sixth layer to our cake uh, if possible, um, but I recognize that it has marginal returns <laughs> because uh, right. uh, 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 risk is a negative. So therefore, how do we respond to risk through risk communication? So now we've got six. Um, uh, Jeff, do you want to add a seventh on? We could add a, we can have a seven story mountain here. Uh, Thomas Merton, one of the great, uh, I think that was the title of the book, The Seven Story Mountain, um, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Um, um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't want to add another layer, but I do. I'd love your thoughts on, I had a uh, great discussion with a friend who by nature, he's a contrarian, but within the mainstream, and he, he was really hesitant to take the vaccine. And we had a great discussion about history, right? Um, and we we're talking about the US government and yeah, I'm, out, I'm old enough to remember the thalidomide baby controversy, right? When everybody came out and said thalidomide is safe. And then the drug actually ended up causing a lot of birth defects as I, I'm sure you will remember. And also, um, and I think it was President Clinton that apologized, the US government also did syphilis experiments on, in particular, black, black enlisted men. So right, there's, right. there's a history yeah. of, and I'm not picking on the US government, governments all over the world have, have, have done not great things, um, but there's a history of governments doing not great things. You talked about I'm going to guess what is it? Ten years, the typical length of time for a vaccine during during regular time. Five to, just five to ten years, actually. I believe that was about five to ten years for the normal progress of science to develop an effective, safe, and effective vaccine. Uh, one of the problems with the current vaccine is we don't have those five to ten years even to do the clinical trials to see whether or not five years from now there might be something going on that we don't know about. Um, so there's a reality to some of the concerns. I mean, uh, uh, but in order to get a full evaluation of vaccine, you typically would need five to 10 years. Right. right. And I just noticed in the comments, Cindy talked about there was a rumor that spread quickly in Muslim countries that the Pfizer vaccine had proteins from pork. And, yeah. and, and so you've got these, I mean, good news, bad news. As you know, the world is uh, more connected than it's ever been before. Good news, bad news. So then, the <laughs> bad news, uh, bad news typically travels faster than good news. So yeah. it's there's a lot of layers to their cake, but it's actually you know I have a lot of empathy for people. And my friend's like, I don't I don't think I'm going to get the vaccine. He's very careful. Yeah. He's, he's and, and he's not he's not he's not out there. He lives in 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 uh, you know outside of the big cities. He doesn't right. have a lot of interactions. Like I'd rather play it safe for a bit and and yeah. not get the vaccine and i said and i, I go to empathy right that you've you've yeah. taught ben and i go to empathy i'm like you need to make the, right. the health decision that's best for you i on the other hand i went and i got uh, the vaccine yesterday i can barely move my left arm <laughs> today ben told me to suck it up it's a normal side right. effect uh so there are really legitimate yeah. I'm, I'm excluding the fringe on on either right. end because yeah. uh, part of me thinks we'll never get to them but but to your point there are really legitimate concerns yeah so actually i'm going to take advantage of i'm going to put a seventh layer on our cake okay um and that is uh admissions of uncertainty uh acknowledging and because i believe that we've really given a a false premise to the world that science can give us determinate information, uh, you know, this is safe, this is effective, absolutes in other words, uh, as opposed to the opposite view, which is science is a work in progress. Um, uh, uh, you could argue never complete. Uh, and as we continue to promote science as the answer to the question, uh, we undermine our, our trust. It goes, so it goes back to that trust uh, how can you say I should trust you when you keep changing your mind every three weeks about dot, dot, dot? Uh, and one of the most effective communications I've ever witnessed from a case study was the communications by uh, Dr. Richard Besser, B-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E he's on television a lot. I'm not sure if they show him a lot in Canada. Uh, he's the head of the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation. Uh, he used to be the head of CDC. Then he became uh, a lead uh, health specialist on one of the major networks. I think it was ABC. 
And I still remember vividly his first words on pandemic influenza. This was the pen H1N1. He started off with Kerry Nusser. We're concerned about what we're seeing. Uh, and we hear that a lot of other people are concerned as well. Okay. Then he said, and what we say today about the pandemic may have to change tomorrow. Uh, from the very beginning, he laid out a foundation of acknowledging uncertainty that science is a work in progress, not a, uh, a completed work that you put in your, on your wall and put a frame around it in the process. And uh, until we get that notion across, uh, there's gonna be distrust. Why? Because if you say, well, uh, this is a safe vaccine and then you find someone dying from a blood clot the next day, uh, well, that's what science is doing. We're looking for, uh, is it out of the ordinary in terms of number of adverse effects? Uh, for most substances, the adverse effect is approximately one in a million, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, let's say, allergic responses, that it would have se severity. That's exactly where we're seeing with the vaccination right now. We're seeing these one in a million pop up. And of course, we're doing three million a week. So therefore, you're going to see three people a week. Um, and, then, and so, uh, Ben, I'm going to add a seventh layer um, acknowledgement of uncertainty, <laughs> which yeah. is uh, which scientists don't like to do. You know, we'd like to say, you know, is it going to be the rain tomorrow? Um, no, <laughs> uh, uh, there, there, is, there isn't a rain cloud within a thousand miles of uh, where I am. So, of course, it's not going to rain tomorrow. And then it rains. <laughs> And that's uh, one of our core principles is, is always trying to avoid using absolutes. And the, yeah. the other thing I've seen occurring a lot lately is the making of promises. Oh, so right. Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has had several press conferences where he's promised, I promise that every Canadian, if they want it, can have a vaccine by June 1st. And when you make a statement like that, oh, and sure. then all of a sudden yeah. we run into supply shortages, recalls of vaccinations... Uh, you know, different interferences. Right. And so when you make a promise like that, even if you miss that target by one day, you know, or a week, you're, you're oh, sure. no, your no. trust. No, no, right. And so no. even if he, even if he had to reposition that slightly to say, our goal is, our goal is to have everybody in our country vaccinated. Yeah. Simply rephrasing um, it by avoiding an absolute or making a, pre yeah. uh, making a promise can yeah. help with your credibility. It's, it's fascinating, but uh, uh, I was just reading some research on um, lying. Um, and the research indicates that small lies, such as missing a target by one day, can be as consequential as big lies. Uh, typically, we tend to think of the small lies, oh, just you know, sweep that away. It's no big deal. It's not going to make a difference. It turns out psychologically, they have much greater impact than anyone ever suspected before. Uh, and so therefore, the, the communi risk communication solution to that is to talk about targets, goals, um, objectives. Um, I'm strongly committed to having a vaccine available for every Canadian by June. That's my commitment as a goal, yeah. as opposed to I promise every Canadian will get uh, a, a vaccination by June 1st. If you're off by one day, the person will say, well, that's no big deal. Yes, it is exactly. a big deal. It is a big deal, yeah. uh, especially it starts leading to uh, an erosion. For example, it's almost like water on a rock that it just keeps eroding. People will say, well, what about also? What about this? What about this? What about this? And suddenly you've got this rolling rock that has been um, totally devoid of anything uh, of and, substance. And masks, and that's not, masks I just, don't work. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that. Thank you, Ben. We yeah. started the, up, up here, at least anyway, Vincent, with the message from our health uh, our our uh, health officers that masks don't stop the spread the spread of COVID nineteen, right? And that was an absolute. But by the way, the the word that'll make Ben's head pop off is insure. Uh, if you use the word insure without understanding that it means guarantee, uh, Ben Ben will Ben will uh, head <laughs> fifth dimension. Okay, so right. you can have fun with that. But but mainly it's uh, yeah. I I, I, he's, I he's taught me hard. Not because it's a great fun corporate word, but it means guarantee. No one would say yeah. I guarantee, right? I guarantee to your point, and and I love it that when you talk about this, the small lie. As soon as we lose a little bit of credibility with our audience, then it's it's a real slippery slope. So it goes down. So when we started up in Canada, masks do not help. And I remember we touched on this last time right. Uh, right. we had the webinar when you said instead of saying at this time with what we know about right. the disease and how it's spread we don't believe that mass help but that may change right? right science is always evolving science is always changing right. 
we did none of that. I, I, I think all the um, you know leadership of politicians went to the school of we have to be strong and and resolute and and it's just it's not right. helpful. The yeah. one that drives me nuts is when Trudeau says, "We're here for you. Yeah. We have yeah. your back." I don't know what that means. <laughs> have my back? Is he is he at my front door? I don't know what that means, right? And it just it's so anti everything. All of uh, your research and and the stuff that you've your theories have proven to be true. So um, it, it it is honestly frustrating from a crisis communications point of view. Uh, um, and, and Jeff, think about what you're saying. It, it there's this feedback loop though, um, is that if you if you are stressed and you're looking, you become more distrustful. That was how we started. I, I added another, is that when people are highly stressed, and more than just stressed, so for example, by risk, but highly stressed, for example, their whole lives have been disrupted. You know, they've been, you know, I haven't seen another human being as if they were in a cave for a year. Uh, that's, that's highly stressful for most individuals, let alone the potential to die or have loved ones die. All these things are highly stressful. That we tend to be more distrustful. And the problem with that is that when because we tend to look for certain individuals that want to give us determinist turn, what are called determinist, deterministic views, yes or no, um, is this vaccine safe? Is a is a mask going to protect me? Uh, uh, will lockdowns really make a difference, for example, in a process? And we tend to gravitate to people who want to give us those deterministic views, as opposed to ones that want to give us acknowledge uncertainty. Why? Because it's less attractive. Um, if I, if you're near, uh, if, if, if I say to you, uh, Jeff, um, uh, don't travel, for example, right now to India. Um, uh, and you say, well, how sure are you? Um, I, I'm somewhat sure. It depends sort of on where you go in India and whether or not you've been vaccinated. In fact, there are 33 variables that uh, will determine whether or not you want to go to India or not. Uh, and then there's someone next to me who says, Jeff, don't go to India. <laughs> don't go to India. <laughs> who are you going to turn to? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm not going to India right now. <laughs> Either way. But what, from what I know now, in the long run, I would look to the more uh, reasoned, moderated, as you always say, make your three proof points, right? Like, right. Um, that, that's what I'm attracted to now. And I guess that's the the frustrating part is right. Like our, um, as you said, we're attracted to the bold and perhaps the not so smart, right? As long as they're, as long as they're bold, we're, we're attracted to that. And it's just, it's disheartening, right? It's, um, and you're right. We're all, we're all feeling the pandemic. We've not been through right. this right. before. I mean, even a hundred years ago, it wasn't, I, you know, it wasn't like this. I get there was a lot worse, maybe medically, but we weren't so connected. All right. Um, um, it, it does give us stories as uh, it, when we're sitting with our grandchildren on our laps. Uh, when I lived through the pandemic. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you don't have to walk two miles in the snow. Like right. Right. <laughs> right. Um, That'll make me feel like an old, an old man. And also yelling, get off my lawn at the kids when they come in. <laughs> uh, Vincent, if you're okay, just yeah. in the few minutes we have left, uh, maybe I'd like just to toss it to a couple of folks. I know sure, I sure. Christo Christopher Ad Adamson. Good, good. Um, did you just want to ask your question? Just kind of where you're headed with it? Feel free to. I'd love to hear a voice. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, come on. Uh, sometimes uh, I always get freaked out by those movies where, you know, a nuclear bomb hit and you're playing your radio and all there is is static. Uh, uh, and then suddenly a voice comes on. Uh, and yeah. you know that there are other human beings in the universe that are not robots or terminators or whatever else they might be. So, uh, Chris, if, if you're out there, it'd be great to hear your voice. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's great. Hi, Chris. Excellent. Yeah, my, my question was about uh, how we can talk about um, the kind of knock-on effects of mitigation efforts. I'm uh, thinking of the rise of depression, substance abuse. I've talked to some people in those fields, too, and, and they're, they're seeing it firsthand, and it's... Uh, starting to get a bit overwhelming and overwhelming for some professionals in those areas. Wondering how we yeah. can talk about that without yeah. it feeding into the polarization and the aforementioned politicization of messaging. So it, yeah. can, so it isn't an either or, but rather, you know, yeah. with both factors as we continue. Right. To and, and, and just to make sure I heard you correctly, because it was a little muffled, you were talking about depression, people's yeah, yeah. depressed, how, how, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that, that kind of the, 
the collateral effects of mitigation yeah. efforts and how we can yeah. talk about that without it becoming yeah. an either or scenario. So, Chris, Sunday night, I, I find very exciting. Again, I was talking about advances in, in knowledge over the past 50 years. I mentioned Professor Sandman's work. Um, there's incredible work taking place uh, with a professor at Yale University on the science of well being. It's a free course, it's 14 weeks long, it requires quite a bit of commitment. Uh, at Yale University, they had a 800 person, I think, waiting list to take the course at the university. They open it up to the world. Anybody who wants to take a course can take it. And if ever I heard something that would relate to your question, it's what's coming out of that research, the science of well-being. Uh, for example, there's usual things that relate to well-being. And, the, and also one of the things they found is the depression is not the same thing as happiness. Uh, there's a, 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 we often think of those as two sides of the same coin. They're not. Um, uh, at the same time, is it's worth spending a lot of time on depression and also uh, the counterbalance uh, that comes from well-being. For example, uh, they find that gratitude uh, is a key element. Uh, we, we know the usual suspects, such as relationships and, and money, or at least a certain amount of money, et cetera. Uh, uh, what they were surprised about, how much gratitude makes a difference. Uh, in how a person, gratitude for what we have. Uh, little experiments where people have to, have to fill out a gratitude uh, diary at the end of the night uh, before they go to sleep. One thing for which they're happy about that day. Um, uh, and they were able to show that that simple behavioral act uh, had a, a more than a significant difference in terms of person's well-being. Uh, and again, that's not gonna, the, the, the roots of depression can be uh, very different from the ones that are the roots of well-being. Uh, but nonetheless, I would argue they're still are related to each other, even if they're not opposite sides of the coin. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other one, of course, is the traditional one about the importance of relationships. Uh, and, and I would argue if, if there is a solution to that is getting people working together. Uh, when I, I'll give you an example of this. I was reading about this successful vaccination case up in um, uh, Connecticut. And it started off with a physician who wrote a letter uh, and then uh, to everyone, all of the people and, and said, I'd like to talk to you. He talked to all of his patients on Zoom uh, and they quite literally were able to have effectively what we're doing here, a coffee clutch with his patients in order to talk about vaccination. Um, and I would argue that was more than just the knowledge uh, sharing. It was, a, um, uh, it was a coffee, the same thing we're doing here. Uh, how often have you ever seen a, a personal physician have a Zoom with all their patients? Now, of course, it's, there's patient confidentiality, whether or not you want to join it or not, even admit, for example, but nonetheless, he's a general, uh, uh, a general practice surgeon. And this notion of getting people to work together, which is also fascinating uh, for crisis, uh, the notion that people panic during a crisis, uh, uh, has been disproven as much as possible by science, that people come together, uh, and uh, so using all these devices we have for coming together, just in the same way, we just came together with a coffee chat. Um, uh, many folks here I've never met before. I do hope I meet at some point in the future. Uh, given the limits of life, I would suspect that this may be our first time to chat together. Um, and yet we've had a chat. Um, that, that we have. And that's one o'clock. Do you have a couple more minutes or do you... I, or, um, I, I think I, 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 I've got about five more minutes if, if uh, I, I'd love to take, and if I can hear another voice, it convinces me that there's more than uh, <laughs> three people left on earth. <laughs> there's a yeah, so I thought maybe, <laughs> after, um, five, after five, there's only marginal returns uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> populations on earth. <laughs> I thought I would okay, see I'm you. I'm just going to uh, say hello, Vincent. Hello, Vincent. Jody from Edmonton, Alberta. Oh, Canada. hi, Jody. Hi, wonderful uh, voice. <laughs> like, <laughs> thank you. That's great. Nice. This is great discussion. Thank you very much. I'm glad I've dropped in. This is great. This is great. Ryder, Ryder, am I going to say Romani, right? Did I say that? Ryder Romani? Uh, Rida Romani. Close to Romani. The Romani was right. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, hi Romani. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't think I have time for questions, but. This is a really great session. Uh, really enjoyed all that uh, you shared with everybody. Thank you. Good. Ron, I'm going to put you on the spot, Romani. Of all the things we talked about today, what what might you share at dinner tonight? 
<laughs> is there anything that I'm putting you on the spot? This is my professorial hat on. Um, uh, <laughs> of all the things that we've chatted about in, the, in our hour together, is there anything that stays with you that you might, for example, share with others? Um, I, for me, I think um, it's the trusted source um, and maintaining trust, which comes down. It comes down to. Um, when we don't have enough information, be honest that we don't have enough information. And right. also the, the fact that we discussed about absolutes and not speaking in absolutes, um, the, the comment about the mass and that made me laugh because my mom in, in Pakistan was talking about mass um, and the importance of wearing it. And since the Canadian government was saying no, uh-huh. I was resolute in saying no. So it just, it, it, it makes me laugh that when we talk in absolutes, we really right. do end up alienating people. Sorry, those are my kids in the background as it's uh, no, very that's much great. lunchtime. And, for and actually you had three you had three takeaways. I only asked for one, so you get triple A. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good. Great. Uh, okay, we're gonna squeeze in one more. I just thought maybe um, Patrice, did you wanna I know you're a Patrice, I know you're a big uh, Dr. Cavello fan. Indeed. Uh, so great to meet you, even if uh, virtually. Oh, my, great, one, great. Okay, one, that, uh, actually, I can see you too. Is that right? Right. Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's very good. Uh, so, right. from just outside Toronto here, one question for you. Obviously, long duration events have their own challenges as right. people get through message fatigue and on top of mask fatigue and in my mm. hospital, uh, PPE and everything ah. and social distancing. Uh, mm. What are some tricks you might want to give us in terms of like refreshing or keeping our messages fresh? Um, I'll, I'll go back to the one of the oldest technique. Uh, I, I don't like to use the word tricks. I, I'll call them techniques. <laughs> um, I, I still, my mother uh, used to always accuse me of being a spin doctor. And, uh, um, and I, I said that spin is not what I do. I try to tell the truth, tell it well, as best as one can with the tools available. I try to keep it less than 27 words. So, um, and I would argue the way to keep it fresh is what the oldest technique in the world, which is storytelling. Storytelling. Uh, I'll give another uh, plug to science, the importance of storytelling as a way by which to share health information. Uh, uh, storytelling has all these advantages of visuals, uh, attentiveness, recall, et cetera, uh, but also it engages people emotionally. emotionally. Uh, and each story, I would argue, is unique. In the same way, you can argue there was an old TV program. You know, uh, there's a, eight million people in New York, and every person has a story to tell. Um, I, I find it great sometimes. I get in a taxi cab, and I ask the person. I start really talking to them. What's your story? You know, how did you wind up here in New York? And everyone is unique. Uh, and really, quite literally, I don't want to leave the cab by the time I get to wherever, taxi cab, wherever I've gone to. And so if we embed within our culture the skills of storytelling, uh, that I would argue it keeps everything fresh, fresh and alive, uh, uh, just like springtime. So How about great. that? How about that? <laughs> Love great it. finish. <laughs> Vincent, uh, Vincent, thanks so much for taking the time to join us and, and pop in. Oh, my, my pleasure. Uh, I will have. I always say when when we when Jeff and I get time with you, I try to find the bounty paper towel because I just feel like a sponge every time. I can <laughs> I just soak up as much Vincent right. as I can. Um, we could talk I, to you all day, Vincent. You're like catnip for us. Oh, I'll, this is great. Right? I'll let, I'll let I, you, actually, uh, I do have catnip in my garden. You can see my garden. <laughs> <laughs> FYI, for it, for those of you that are joining us, Dr. Cavallo has one of the most amazing gardens in uh, the New York area that's on the New York Garden Tour. So when we're allowed yeah. back to yeah. travel and explore the world, check out uh, the garden tour, including the Cavallo's well, Garden. Let me add that one more technique, gardening as a solution to, uh, <laughs> uh, besides storytelling, to keep us fresh. Uh, the, the, if you want to see the, the beauty of the world, uh, watch what happens at springtime. Uh, there you go. Great reminder. I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm going to stick around for a while. I don't feel you need to log off, but we do have to let Vincent go. Um, but I, I see so many uh, friends from around the world. So if you're happy to stick around and have a chat, um, we won't hang up right away. Uh, and uh, 
excited to say that next month, the first Thursday of June, so you'll hear me, if you know me, I, uh, I'll talk about Vincent Cavello as the godfather of crisis and risk communications. Next month, we have the great uncle of crisis and risk communications, and that's Dr. Timothy Coombs. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, Timothy Coombs. He is a Texas A&M University and a professor, researcher, who really, uh, when we teach, most of us who teach crisis and risk communications at university use Timothy Coombs' books. Uh, although, can I tease out that you have a book coming, Vincent? Yes, I have a book out coming, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in manuscript form and going through the final edits right now. And it'll be called, the word risk communication will be part of the title. Hey, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, alert. Yeah. the bad, the yeah, bad news, though, is it's about 500 pages long, though. So that's the bad <laughs> news. Um, so, yeah, next next month, same time, same place, Dr. Timothy Coombs will be joining us. So feel free to drop in uh, for that session as well. Thanks again so much. Vincent. Okay. And we'll Great to see you, Vincent. Great nice to see everyone. So much. Take, Take care. Yep. Take good and care. Bye bye.